Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Um, as we continue our series through the Sermon on the Mount and through Matthew in general, kind of a, I've said before, this is a series within a series within a series um, in Matthew. And uh, it, it's, it's just been so wonderful for me. Some weeks of preparation are very difficult, and some weeks are, are, are a little bit easier. Uh, and, and, but all, whether it's been a difficult week or whether it's been an easy week in preparation, all has been profitable uh, for me personally. And I trust it's been profitable for you as we've studied. I've heard even testimonies from different people within our church family, how going over the Beatitudes and, and, and seeing those one by one and in light of context and scripture has helped them. And, um, and it, I, I just want you to know it's, it's ministering to me if it's not ministering to you. Okay, but here's what I know, that it's ministering to you because it's the Word of God. And God, and we'll talk about that this morning, how God's Word accomplishes something. And um, so I'm so thankful to be here, and I, I hope that you are, you are benefiting as well. Let me read Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word and the confidence we can have in it that it's true, that it's infallible, and that it accomplishes something. And so do that this morning, we pray, according to your will, that I would do everything you send it forth to do for your glory and the glory of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Among professing Christians, there are a variety of views on the Old Testament. The last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the Old Testament from verse 17, haven't we? And we've been focused on, on the law and the prophets. But understand, among professing Christians, there's a lot of views on the Old Testament. For example, there's the Torah-observant Christians. These people would say you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But as a Christian, now you must obey all of the law. Not just concerned with the moral law, but concerned with the ceremonial law, concerned with the judicial law. Law. So yeah, and the, the, the dietary laws, you can't eat unclean foods. They argue that Paul is misinterpreted by most pastors. They ignore or reinterpret Peter's vision. They encourage people who come into that community to wean themselves away from their church and from their pastor because their pastor and their church are probably going to lead them into Pauline doctrine, which is dangerous and away from the Old Testament. The irony is that it ignores the impossibility of embracing the judicial law, doesn't it? I mean, I've not heard of many people put in prison for stoning their rebellious children, so they are falling short in their observance of the Torah, of the Old Testament law. Then you have on the other side, there are those who teach that the law is gone, that the law has been done away with, that Jesus came and now we are just under grace. Romans 6, 14, they would say, says, for sin, sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And so they would say, don't quote the law to people. Don't command them to obedience. Just let God's grace wash over you. You just need the grace of Jesus Christ. They do believe that there is justification in Christ, that you must believe in Christ, but they believe that sanctification is a, is a whole different matter, that it's completely separate from justification. As I said when we baptized Keith and Debbie, that sanctification is a result of justification, that the two go together, that there is not justification and no sanctification, that would not be true justification. 
And they, they would teach easy believism. Um, they would teach what some call free grace. It's free grace. I prefer to call it weak grace. Some call it cheap grace. But it's grace that is powerful enough to justify you, but it's not powerful enough to sanctify you. You need an extra level of grace to be sanctified. But as far as the law goes, it's, it's null, it's void. They're antinomian, which means anti-law. They're against the law. They would negate the law. So you have these Torah-observant Christians, and you have this other extreme, the antinomians who say, just forget the law. Who cares what the Torah says? We have the New Testament. We can ignore the Old Testament. And then there are some who say that the Old Testament is just irrelevant altogether. In fact, um, we have talked a number of times about Andy Stanley here and his unhitching from the Old Testament. Just, I think it was in 2018, he came out with that book to unhitch. We need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Let me show you what that leads to. In the last year, he's been saying our faith is, does not hinge on 66 now. That's not 37, that's 66 ancient books. Um, What's funny is he says it hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then someone, I watched somebody ask him, so how do we know Christ raised from the dead? Well, we have the account of Matthew, Mark, Luke. That's four of the 66 ancient books there, Andy. You are relying on 66 ancient books for your faith. And he would say, so, so what, the, uh, the, what happens is if you unhitch from the Old Testament, what you'll do is you'll unhitch from the New because his whole motivation was to be okay with sin that is condemned throughout all the scriptures because he knows some people who profess Christ who are, are in homosexual lifestyles and he says, well, I've got I've to make this congruent. So he's allowed his experience to overrule the scripture. And that's where he was always headed and we must be aware of people such as that. And then there's everything in between. When it comes to the Old Testament, to the law of God, there's every view in between. Some who take pieces and portions. But the question I want to answer today, I think Christ answers in the scripture for us today is, what is the correct view of the law? Don't you want the correct view of the law? I want the correct view. Well, let me tell you this. There's only one who has the correct view. It's only one. It ain't me. (laughs) It's Jesus. It's Christ. God's the only one that has the correct view on his law. My view is even skewed. Even today, I'm I'm trying to conform my view to Christ's view. And that's what we're doing this morning. But all of our views are skewed, but there's only one whose view is perfect. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's who we're going to learn from this morning in these verses 17 through 20. The view Jesus has of the law of God. Because that's the view we must have if we're going to follow our head, Jesus Christ. And I hope you're with me in that. So let's just do some review. We covered 17 the last couple of weeks. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. And we, we talked about Jesus did not come to abolish the law. What are the law and the prophets? That is the Old Testament. Moses gives the law. The prophets call people to the law. And remember, the link between the, the law and the prophets is the book of, anybody remember? Come on. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is your link between the law and the prophets. If you want to understand the Old Testament, learn Deuteronomy. And then you can go back into the law and you can go into the prophets and it all starts to fit together when you hear about the cursings and the blessings promised to Israel based on their obedience to the law. In fact, you could argue the whole Old Testament is really about the law because the prophets are always hearkening back to the law. And so the whole Old Testament continues to speak the law. But why would these people think that Jesus may have come to abolish? Why would his disciples think that Jesus may have come to abolish? Well, there's a, there's a few thoughts on that. First of all, the Pharisees giving the extra law, right? They were going beyond the law, giving all the rules and their definitions to the law so that they might give you the clarity of the law. And of course, they went way beyond. And so when Jesus comes in and says, your traditions, your man's traditions, you put them above the law. And they would say, he's abolishing the law. And so Jesus is getting ahead of that accusation. By the way, the people don't like all the rules, being burdened down with the rules that the Pharisees have given. They want to throw off the law. They want Messiah to come and just bring the spirit of the law. And Jesus says, don't think that either. I'm not abolishing the letter, and I'm not abolishing the spirit. Uh, I came to what? Not to abolish, but I came to fulfill. I came to fill it up. 
And we talked about how Jesus fulfills the prophecies last week. 300 of them fulfilled, over 300, fulfilled in Christ. Every part of the Old Testament is about Christ. All of the types of Christ are fulfilled in Jesus. And he will fulfill it all in the end. There are some still remaining that he will still fill up. Jesus clarifies the law. Not that the law needed clarification. Was there any flaw in the law? No flaws whatsoever in the law. But Jesus came to give the truest definition, not because it wasn't true in the Old Testament, not because it wasn't clear, but because it was being perverted by men. And so Jesus comes forward and he fulfills the law by clarifying it, giving the righteousness that is behind it. Because the law demonstrates the righteousness of God. Remember, his commands and his character. That is the definition of God's righteousness. It is his commands and his character. You could say it is the letter and it is the spirit. And so the law, Jesus points out the righteousness of God in the law. Jesus kept the whole law, morally, judicially, ceremonially. He kept ceremonially. He kept it perfectly. And at the cross, he paid the judicial penalty for the law. At the cross, he fulfilled all the ceremonial law that, that was meant to be fulfilled there as he was the Passover lamb and fulfilled those feasts, still some yet to be fulfilled in those shadows. He brings forth the one new man in the church so that we don't have to worry about so much the ceremonial and judicial law, except we need to learn God's character in that. We need to learn what it teaches about who God is, his character, but we don't have to be concerned about putting to death people um, because the judicial law was for Israel specifically, but it certainly does teach us a lot about God's character, doesn't it? A lot about God's holiness and character and who he is. And he brings forth the one new man in the church. Now it's Jew and Gentile. There's no longer Jew and Gentile in the church, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? We're reconciled together in Christ. There's no distinction among the church any longer. But most of all, we talked about the fact that, that Jesus Christ fulfills the law on our behalf. He fulfills the law on behalf of lawbreakers. He fulfills the law on behalf of the lawless. Praise God for that. He filled up the perfect law. Remember we talked about the law being a sale. It's a perfect sale. It's no flaw in the sale. But if you put the sail on a mast and there's no wind, it will not sail. It will not fulfill its purposes. Not because there's a flaw in the sail. But it's not fulfilling its purpose completely until the wind fills it up. And the law doesn't fulfill its purpose completely until Christ fills it up. But it has a purpose before Christ. And we'll even look at that. Jesus gives us that this morning. The sail that we couldn't fill up ourselves. The sail for all who believe, for all who walk according, not, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And Jesus fulfills for all who believe. One point I didn't bring out in verse 17 that I think is important, another reason they might have thought Jesus came to abolish the law is this is right after he gave the Beatitudes. And they might have looked at those Beatitudes and say, well, this is different than the law. And Jesus is saying, those Beatitudes I just taught you, they fulfill the law. This is not different. This is not a new teaching separate from what you were given. This is the same teaching. I'm clarifying it. I'm giving you clarity on what it all means. And so I didn't bring that out the last couple of weeks, but I want to make sure to point that out this morning, that that's another reason people may have thought Jesus came to abolish the law of the prophets. And so we come to verse 18, and he says this, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all it is, is accomplished. Truly I say to you, Jesus uses this phrase 30 times in the book of Matthew. He uses this, time, this phrase 13 times in the book of Mark, three times in the book of Luke, and John 25 times. But in John, he adds another truly. For truly, truly, I say to you. Did Jesus ever not speak the truth? I mean, is he saying, hey, I know everything else I said you might not believe, but believe this one. No, no. He always spoke the truth. <laughs> Why would Jesus make this point of saying, for truly I say to you? Well, it's very similar to some phrases we might use. Like, don't we, have you ever said to somebody, let me be honest with you here. Now, does that imply you've been dishonest the last 
10 sentences and now you're finally going to give me the truth? No, there's a clarification to that, right? There's a, there's a focus on what I'm going to say next. If I say, let me be straight with you, let me be honest with you, let me tell you something, I'm going to draw attention to what I'm about to say next. And Jesus here is saying, look what I'm going to tell you. Listen closely. Not that we should listen less to anything else, yet there's a, there's a, a drawn attention to what he says in verse 18, and what does he say? Until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Let's get some definitions here. What is the smallest letter? The, the, the Greek word there is yoda. It is the letter I, basically. It's very simple to make. You just, I mean, from your perspective, it would be that, that way, I guess. But I mean, it's a, it takes a very small amount of ink, a very small amount of effort to write an yoda. It's an I without a dot on it, if you would. It's, it's the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. Stroke. What's a stroke? You could say that's the horn. If you, if you were to write the letter N, you notice on the upper left-hand corner, there's a little horn on the top of it. That just that little bit, that's a stroke. It's, it's the smallest part of the letter. All right? It's the smallest part of the letter. What does it mean to be accomplished? He uses the word accomplished at the end. It means to come, this is so interesting, it means to come into existence, that it will all come to be, that it will all happen, that it will all appear, that it will all be performed. And what is Jesus saying here? He's saying heaven and earth will pass away before the smallest stroke or the smallest letter, the smallest part, the smallest portion of the law of God will be accomplished before that. It will be done. It will be performed. It'll be performed. Not, not just it'll stand, but it'll, it'll be done. It, it'll happen. You say the law will happen. Does that, I mean, it's a written word. What Jesus is saying is this is just not just a written word. This is not just writing on a page. This is not just knowledge and information for you. This is much more than that. The law, being the perfect sale, is intended to do something. It's intended to perform something. Like a sail gets filled with the wind and propels the boat forward, the law is intended for a purpose, for action. It does something. The law is perfect. It does not lack anything, but it still must be accomplished. It still must be performed. Not because, not, not because it's lacking anything before it's performed. It's perfect before it's performed, just like the sail is perfect before it's filled with wind. But it's not fulfilling its full purpose until it's filled up with wind. The law has a function. The law has a duty. The law has a role to fulfill. And like a sail without wind, the law will not perform its full duty until it is fully filled up by Christ. Nothing, here's what you need to understand. Here's, Jesus, is giving us, Jesus is giving us God's view on the law. He's giving us here in verse 18, God's view on the law. And here's God's view. Nothing in the Old Testament is wasted. It is all very important. It is all for a purpose. It is all accomplishing something. Those dietary laws that you go, what's the point of not eating shrimp? I mean, do you know how good shrimp is? It's good. Anybody eat shrimp? I like shrimp. Okay, you know, I mean, what's it? Or bacon. Come on now. <laughs> Pat's back there just, yes. <laughs> I mean, what's the point of all of that? And we, we get to Leviticus and Numbers and we go, oh, hi, just, I just, we start reading about the sacrifices and the duties of the priest, and we go, this is wearisome. Imagine having to do it all. <laughs> I mean, we should learn it. But imagine you have to learn it so well that you can do it. That's a lot of learning, isn't it? That's a, that's a lot of study that that would take. But you need to understand, even the genealogies. How many of you love reading through the genealogies? I cannot pronounce these names. I just... Fake it till I make it. You know what I mean? Like Wednesday night, we've gone through Nehemiah. We've hit a couple of genealogies, and I read through them, and I'm like, yeah, uh, uh, Naphtali, 
you know, I, I don't know how to pronounce it either. That's okay. That's not the point necessarily is having the correct pronunciation. It all has a purpose. It is all important. Every part of the law of God, of the Old Testament, in fact, include today the New Testament. Every part is vitally important. There's nothing that's wasted. Nothing in the Word of God is a waste. Nothing in it is something that we can say, ah, it's not really important at all. Nothing. Jesus says, until heaven and earth pass away. Who brings forth the end of heaven and earth? Who brings it forth? Tell me, church. Who brings forth the passing away of heaven and earth? Satan? Come on, tell me. Who brings it forth? God does. God brings forth the passing of heaven and earth. Who gave all of those words in the Word of God? Who gave all those words? Come on. You can talk to me. It's okay. God did. God gave all of those words. So God causes heaven and earth to pass away. So it won't pass away until God says so, correct? And God gave the entire Old Testament. He gave it all to us. Every, every stroke, every letter, it was all given by God. So who is going to make sure it's accomplished? God will. God will make sure it is all accomplished. Jesus, I said before, is describing for us God's view of his word. God's view of his word. That his word does something, that it was set forth to do something, that it is active, that it is alive, that it is working. It's what Isaiah said in chapter 55, verse 11. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what pleases me and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. God doesn't waste a word. Every word goes out, and it does exactly what he sent it forth to do. It will not fail. Not one portion of it. Or you could look in the New Testament, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing, do you hear the action in that? Piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge... This is the word of God. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I can't do that. I can't look at you and see your action and know the intentions and the thoughts of your heart. I, I can try to draw it out. It's a deep well, we're taught in Proverbs, right? It's a deep well, and I can, a man of understanding draws it out. But I've got to work at drawing it out. But the word of God, that's why when we counsel, we give you the word of God. Because I can't figure it out, but the word of God can. The Word of God is able to do it, to get to your intentions and thoughts of your heart. And there is no creature, none of you in here, are able to hide from its sight. No creature. There's none in here who can hide from the Word of God and what it set out to accomplish. There's no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are uncovered and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we have an account to give. Let me tell you something. This is kind of like truly I say to you, right? Let me tell you something. Focus right here. Those who devalue, who diminish the word of God, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, those who say the word of God is stale, irrelevant, those who look at it as an ancient, dusty old book that is stagnant, That is for another time, another culture. It fails to understand our modern sensibilities and the enlightened age that we live in. And its wisdom and culture are for another day and not for today. It doesn't understand women's rights and and homosexuality that we've learned about. That was written for another time, for another people. Let me tell you something. Those people are fools. Fools. Those people are fools. And they are fools, you need to understand this, they are fools who oppose God. They are fools who are hostile to God. And I know some of those men sit in pulpits or maybe stand in pulpits. Well, most of them sit today that do this kind of thing. They sit in pulpits or stand in pulpits today and claim to be, claim, claim to be representatives of Christ. They're in churches today. They're wolves. And we ought to have nothing to do with them. They're fools. You say you're saying they're not in Christ? I don't know. But I just know God's view of the law 
And when I know God's view of the law, if your, law if, your, if your view of the law doesn't start to match up with that, doesn't try to align with that, I will not listen to a word you have to say about him. If you're going to diminish the law of God and say it's stagnant and old, I got, you got nothing from me. You got nothing from me. I don't want to hear from you about it. I don't care if they say they love God. I don't care if they, they are a pastor or have reverend by their name. I don't care if they just claim to have a different interpretation from others do. When plain scripture is just plain and clear. They oppose God and they oppose his purposes. They oppose his work because his word was sent forth to do something. And they are opposing what he sent it forth to do. We need to understand this. But there's something else you need to understand. Let me tell you something else. For truly, I say to you, they will not thwart God's work in his word. In other words, you don't have to fret about it. <laughs> you don't have to run around with your hair on fire going, what are we going to do? We have a lot of false teachers. Don't worry about them thwarting God's work. It will do what he sent it forth to do every time. It will not fail. So we don't have to be overly concerned about it where we lose our joy because, boy, there's a lot of false teaching out there. No, we don't need to lose our joy over that. God's word will finish what he started. It will do what he sends it forth to do. It will not fail. It will all be performed. It will all be fulfilled. It will all be brought to bear it will all be accomplished. God said it would be. So how will his word be accomplished? What will his word do? What, especially here in our context, what does the law do? One thing the law does, and it was spoken earlier in Hebrews 4, it brings all men to the knowledge of sin. It brings every man, every woman, every child to the knowledge of sin and their guilt before a holy God. That they will all stand guilty before God. That those who come to the great white throne judgment, when the books are opened, their life will be compared to the law. And it will condemn everybody who stands in that judgment. And they will all be cast into the lake of fire. And it will be the righteousness of God in the law that they are judged by. It condemns every person on the planet. What else does it do? It brings those who are being saved or those who will be saved to their poverty in spirit. They become poor in spirit when compared to the law. Those who God is saving, those who God is drawing near to himself, who is bringing in, it brings them to the knowledge that they fall short of the glory of God. And when they look at their life and they compare it to the law, they go, I got nothing. And what do they do after they realize their poverty in spirit? They mourn. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. And they get low. I got nothing if I'm going to have anything, God must give it to me. And they humble themselves before God. And they begin to say, I need righteousness. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. And they are filled up with the mercy of God. They are filled up with being pure, being made pure in heart by becoming a, a new creation. Right? They become peacemakers who share the gospel with other people. They're transformed. And they become people who can rejoice in persecution for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's what the law does. The law brings them to the Beatitudes, those who are being saved, those who are learning Christ. And after they are saved, it will continue to convict believers, those who are in Christ, of when they fall short. The law is a tool God will use to continue to sanctify us. He will bring us to justification through it, and he will bring us through sanctification through it. Because it's his righteous standard, and he desires for us to be a holy, blameless people, to walk soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 say this, all scripture, did you catch that? Not some scripture. All scripture is God-breathed and 
I think we stop sometimes and we disconnect the rest of the verse from all scripture is God breathed, then we stop. No, all scripture is God breathed and all scripture is profitable. All scripture is profitable. What's it profitable for? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you see how the law of God works in the life of the believer? How the word of God works in the life of every Christian? Let me ask you, do you want to be a man or a woman of God? A child of God, living for God? Is that who you want to be as a Christian? Do you want to be one who is equipped for every good work? It's through the word of Christ. It's through the word of God that we are equipped for every good work. It's his word that is used in us for sanctification, for equipping. It's, it's what we've said so many times. Be filled with the spirit. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be sanctified by the truth. God's word is truth. It is the word of God that is the sanctifying work. We're washed by the water of the word, Ephesians chapter 5. You see that? No wonder. No wonder God values his word. And why don't we value his word more, right? Why don't we value his word more and more and more? The law of God is the revealed righteousness of God to mankind. It is his commands and his character revealed. So that's God's view of law in verse 18. So then Jesus gives us, a, 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 gives us there a warning and an encouragement in verse 19. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The first warning is that if you annul negate, ignore, who cares about anything in the law of God, you will be considered least. Now, least is a superlative. In other words, the bottom rung, right? The bottom rung, there's nothing lower than that. You will be the lowest. Now, you, you seem to be in the kingdom of heaven, he says here, Right? But you come in, like Paul says, kind of smoky. You know, you, you, all your works are wood, hay, stubble, burned up. You know, if you have gold, silver, precious stones, great reward. But this is the least reward. This is the, the lowest reward. No reward, really, except heaven itself for those who annul or ignore anything. By the way, this is the least commandment. What's the encouragement? The encouragement is to observe it to teach it, observe it, and to teach it. Do it and teach it. You see, there's, there's two, do you see the two things? Just want to make sure you're staying with me. Observe it and what? Teach it. Teach it. Hang on to that. Now, it might seem strange to us that Jesus would say anything is the least of a commandment. I mean, is there something didn't he just say not one little horn, not one smallest letter is going to pass away? But yet here he seems to indicate there's a least. Whoa, that, does that not seem a little incongruent to you on the face of it? But then we have to look at things Jesus said. Is there lesser commandments? There are. What was the greatest commandment? When Jesus was asked that, what did Jesus say? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, right? Love the Lord your God. And he said the second, second greatest. Oh, the second is a little bit lesser than the first. Now, if you get the first, you're going to get the second. Okay, that's probably why it's greater. Because if you get this one totally, all the rest flow out of it, by the way. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, you know what? You won't fail in any portion of the law. <laughs> that's why it's the greatest. But there's another one that's it's lesser. It's not as important. If you focus on this one with missing the first one, you're going to blow it. And the lesser one is love your neighbor as yourself. But that's the second greatest. But he says this sums up everything in the law, doesn't it? It sums up the whole thing. When Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, Matthew 23, the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 23, 23, he said this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I love the way Jesus talks sometimes. I just... I just I'm sorry, but I love that part of Jesus so much. <laughs> I'm not sorry. I love that part of Jesus. I should love all of Jesus. 
he said for this, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. Now, anybody grow mint in here? My mom's downstairs, but I know she has mint, but some of you grow mint. Some of the, I mean, that's small little leaves, right? Uh, dill, dill is like leaf, like very, uh, what do you call it, wispy, right? Dill is very wispy, not much to it. Cumin, same thing, just seeds, right? Ground seeds. And you, and you tithe on these things. He says to the scribes and Pharisees, I mean, you're careful to take, I got 10 leaves here, nine are mine, one goes to the temple. I got 10 seeds here, nine are mine, one goes, I mean, they're, they're weighing it out, right? They're, they're getting the, the gram scale out. Now, they didn't have gram scales, but they get the scale out and they're weighing it out and they're making sure God gets his 10, right? And then he says, and have neglected what? The weightier provisions of the law, the heavier, the meatier provisions of the law justice and mercy and faithfulness. This is more important, he basically says, but these are the things you should have done. He says, you should have done faithfulness. You should have done justice. You should have done mercy. You should have been faithful. But he then says this, you should have done those without neglecting the others. Here's what you need to understand. There are lesser and greater commandments. If, if you come in this week to confess a sin to me in my office this week, I would rather you say, Pastor, I've been coveting my neighbor's Corvette, and that's a sin, and I need to confess that. And by the way, you need to get rid of your coveting, okay? That's a sin, and you need to, you need to work on your coveting. You, know, you need to be sanctified out of your coveting. But I'd be much more thankful than if you came in and said, I murdered my neighbor for his Corvette this week, Okay? right? Because one's greater, okay? I mean, now, coveting might lead to murder. It could. That's why you need to deal with the coveting. But I would much rather hear a confession of coveting than murder this week, okay? Do you see how there are greater and lesser? But to what I, what I say, don't worry about your coveting. You haven't killed him yet. No, I tell you, God's word talks about coveting. It says it's idolatry. This is a serious sin, and now, if you said to me, well, at least I didn't kill him yet, I am thankful for that, okay? <laughs> but you need to work on that idolatrous heart of yours. And we would work through that because I'm not negating any portion of the law for you or for me because we're going to be held to it all. If you break one portion, you're guilty of all, James says. But there are greater and weightier matters of the law by Jesus' own testimony. And so we need to understand there are greater and weightier matters. Christ is concerned, though, with obedience to every part of it, to every portion of it. We must not annul even the least, even the smallest. We must not negate even the little parts of the law. But we must teach and obey the whole law. Who would we think of as great in the kingdom of heaven? I thought about that question as I studied this week. Who would we think is great in the kingdom of heaven? I don't want to list names, but if I said somebody who won millions of people to Christ, you'd probably get a name in your head, right? You'd say, yeah, that guy who had a ministry, who was an evangelist, who, who preached in every country and every nation, who won thousands of Christ, that man would definitely be one of the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Is that what Jesus said? The one who wins the most souls is the greatest. The one who pours his life out for just evangelism. You know what, if that man, and if God, God can use, uh, let me say this a better way. God only has wicked men to use. Paul Washer says this, there are no men of God, great men of God. There's only weak, wicked men who God uses in a great way. But having said that, if God uses one of those men to win thousands to Christ, but that person in their personal life is not obedient? Could God do that? Absolutely he can. That person is not obedient to the word of God and they're negating it to people around them and saying, yeah, don't bother with it. Or they don't teach those people that they're, they're bringing to Christ. They don't disciple them and, and bring them along to teach them the word of God and bring them to sanctification by the word of God. They're actually least. They're actually the least in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. What is Jesus concerned about? What is Jesus here concerned about? All of us can be great in the kingdom of heaven. Everyone in here can be considered great 
in the kingdom of heaven if we continue as believers in Jesus Christ in obedience and in teaching the people the word of God. If we continue being conformed into the image of Christ who kept the whole law perfectly. That's what it means to be conformed in the image of Christ. We need to understand that the church is a teaching ministry. We've gotten away from this, I think, in modern church today. We think it's a reaching-only ministry. That's not primarily. We should be reaching, but we reach people through teaching. The church is a teaching ministry. It's not those who just do, it's those who teach. The church is a teaching ministry. Why do we spend 50-some minutes on a sermon every week? Because I'm teaching you. Why? Because we're a teaching ministry. We could sing more songs and have a shorter sermon, but we're a teaching ministry. And I hope, by the way, we're teaching one another in those songs. That's why we're careful what kind of music we sing. Because we're teaching one another all the time. The church is a teaching ministry. And through our conforming to be like Jesus, he will then use us for his glory. He will use us for his glory. We don't have to work it up ourselves. Our job is to be, how many times have I told you this, church? Our job is to be faithful. Our job is to be faithful. To be faithful to God and his word. And to teach others to do the same. Church, we need to understand this. In my heart, I'm preaching to myself on this one, okay? I've been preaching to myself the whole time. God, I told you this every week. God works me over on, this, on these texts, and then I'm coming to you, and now I'm going to work you over, right? But this one's for me probably more personally than you, but you can listen in. See, church, we don't need great growth. I mean, don't we love having visitors here? Yeah, I do too. But we don't need great growth. We don't need that. Um, we don't need great attendance. We don't need to boast of many salvations or many baptisms. What we need to do is to obey God and his word and teach others to do the same. That's what God wants us to do, to obey him and teach others to do the same. And if we commit to this as a church, then God will use us greatly for his kingdom. I don't know what that'll look like, by the way, you know, sometimes God takes a faithful church and makes it smaller. Sometimes because he sends people out from it. And so they can't grow because they're just sending people out. <laughs> hey, if God does that, so be it. Let him be glorified. Let him be glorified in his church. Let him do with us as he pleases. Verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I want you to first know that Jesus uses the word righteousness. I've been telling you for weeks, the law of God and the, the commands of God and the character of God are righteousness, right? Jesus has been talking about the law, and now he says, your righteousness. You see how Jesus agrees? I didn't get it from myself. Jesus, I agree with Jesus. Jesus didn't agree with me. Okay, let's just be clear. But I'm pointing out to you that I've been telling you for a long time that righteousness is the law of God, the commands of God, and the character of God found in the law of God. And now we see Jesus says righteousness in reference to the law. The law of God reveals his righteousness. And we must understand this. And Jesus makes that very clear in verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now today, we know all about the flaws of the scribes and Pharisees, right? We all look down on them. We don't look up to them. So for us, this verse might be like, ah, yeah, a big deal. Pastor Pass, those hypocrites and those whitewashed tombs. We have to put ourselves in the context of the disciples who looked at the scribes and Pharisees and said, what? I mean, they do everything. Jesus, they tithe on their cumin. I mean, I got I to gotta do more than that. They tied on the dill. I can't even get those wisps apart like that. Yep. And it's got to go further. It's got to surpass. Not just do what they do. No, 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 no. It's got to go way past. But I know it's hard to put in context, so I want you to think about that prayer warrior wid widow that you know, that you say, man, I, I, I don't know if she could even sin anymore. Well, your righteousness will have to surpass hers. And that would mean what? If my righteousness doesn't surpass hers, she's not in the kingdom of heaven. Whoa, this is a problem, isn't it? 
That man who gave up everything to serve God. That pastor who was faithful, faithfully serving and loving your family for many years. Your, your righteousness has surpassed theirs. Has to go further than theirs. Your righteousness must be greater than all of those to enter the kingdom of heaven. Does that not leave you a little poor in spirit this morning? I, I don't have that kind of righteousness. So you're a pastor. I know. Your righteousness has to surpass mine. I guarantee you that. Because I'm not getting there on my righteousness. It just ain't going to happen. That would leave all of us hopeless, helpless, miserable. Hopefully poor in spirit, mourning, lowly, and hungry, and thirsting for righteousness. Because if my righteousness needs to surpass the scribes and the Pharisees or the most faithful person I can think of, I need more righteousness. I need a righteousness that I can't produce. I need a righteousness that I'm unable to get out of me. And church, if we are going to enter the kingdom of heaven, then we need the righteousness of someone else. We need a foreign righteousness that doesn't exist in any man save one man, the man Jesus Christ. We need his righteousness. We've already annulled the least of the commandments and probably some of the greatest at times in our lives We've already annulled them. Our righteousness is, is nowhere going to make it. We've already failed. We've already fallen short. The righteousness we need is found only in Christ Jesus. And only with his righteousness can we enter the kingdom of heaven. Only with his. And so the first question I have for you this morning to close is, are you going to enter the kingdom of heaven? Do you have that righteousness? Is it yours? Say, Pastor, I've gone to church for many years. I don't care. That did not make you righteous. I said a prayer 40 years ago. I don't care. That didn't make you righteous. There's only one who can make you righteous. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And only he can give you the righteousness of Christ. You need the righteousness of Christ on you. And there's only one way to it. And it's through Christ, through the cross. It's through denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following after him. It's becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you know what? You say, but I don't think he'd accept me. My righteousness falls way short. You don't know how far short my righteousness does fall. I'll tell you, Jesus said this. If anyone comes to me, I will not cast them out. You come to Jesus today. Today is the day of salvation. I plead with you. You may not have tomorrow. But God calls you today. His mercy is extended to you now. And it may not be to you this afternoon because you may be gone. Today, it's that serious. Your eternity is at stake. Come to Christ. For those who are confident they're in the kingdom, because, not because of their own righteousness, but because of the grace and mercy of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, they have Christ's righteousness, a foreign righteousness that does not belong to you, but it's yours anyway because God has given it to you. We must teach unbelievers that they are under the law of God. We must go out in our community and tell them you are under judgment, you are under condemnation. Why? Because the law of God has been laid down and you are accountable for it. And see if God might prick their heart through the message of the gospel, through the message of the law to bring them to conviction and to bring them to salvation. Church, we must share the law with people so that they can know their need for the gospel, their need for righteousness. And Christian, I cannot imagine wanting the righteousness of Christ to fill up your sail and then tearing that sail apart afterwards. I can't imagine wanting the righteousness of Christ and then annulling that very righteousness as a Christian. I just can't imagine that being the case, that you hunger and thirst for righteousness to come to Christ, to have his righteousness put on you, and then you live a life that says, I don't want anything to do with righteousness anymore, but I get to go to heaven. I can't imagine that being congruent together. They don't go together. Those whom he justifies, he will sanctify. He will glorify. And so church, in order to obey and observe the law of God, we must learn it. We must be learners. We must learn who he is and his righteousness through his law, his commands and his character. 
And we must have our lives conform to it. Not just learn it, not just know it, but do it. We must be obedient. That is your sanctification, is obedience. It's what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Teaching them to know it? No. Teaching them to observe it. All things that I've commanded you. Teaching them to do it is what the Great Commission calls us to. To make disciples, to make learners. So you must know it, you must do it. And Christian, you've got to teach it. We've got to be teaching one another. I said the church is primarily a teaching ministry, but I don't want you to confuse me on that. That I'm not the only teacher. I might be the one called a shepherd and primarily feed the flock. But I am not the only teacher. We need more teachers. Some of you are sitting here this morning saying, I need to learn. My, my advice to you is keep coming Sunday morning. That, that would be my first lesson if you sat down with me. Keep coming Sunday morning. You're going to learn a lot in the sermons. I mean, have I given you something today to, to learn? I think so. I mean, I've learned a ton this week. I hope I passed something along to you. But keep coming this Sunday morning. That's, that's lesson number one, okay? But if you say, I need to learn. I need to know. I need to know how to do better. I need to know how to do. Not because you're going to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but you just need someone to teach you. I want you to reach out to the office this week and connect with me and say, I want to be a learner. I want to be a learner. Okay? Now, some of you in here say, I want to be a teacher. Like, I'm not perfect, but I know I have some things I could pass along to others. Then I want you to reach out to me this week and say, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a teacher. And then what I'm going to do is if people connect with me, if you do, I'm going to connect those people with each other as best as I can. Some might end up connecting with me. You might get stuck with me too. But, and, and you know what? If I get 15 learners, I guess I'm going to be a very busy man if I get no teachers. And some of you might say, well, I don't know what I have to offer. I I'm not, might not be the best teacher, but I want to walk alongside somebody and help them. Then you let me know. And we'll put you together. And, and you can build a relationship together. And you can learn from someone who teaches and, and, and work together. We're a teaching ministry. We're not, we're not just a social gathering. I said that last week, practicing church discipline, right? We're not just gathering together, just playing games here. We're being sanctified. And so I would encourage you to reach out. Reach out to the office, leave a voicemail, send an email. You can reach out to me personally. If you have my, my you can text me, you can email me. Whatever you need to do, catch, catch me at the service, not a good idea. Because... I talk to 15 people, and I leave here, and I forget. That's a fault with me, not with you, okay? So, but, but reaching out to me in a written communication or something like that or a voicemail would be the best thing to do. Tell me I'm a, I want to be a learner. That's all you have to say. This is so-and-so, I want to be a learner. Click, that's all I need, okay? This is so-and-so, I want to be a teacher. Click, okay. And we'll start connecting some people together because we've got to grow. Not in numbers. We've got to grow in obedience, we got to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? We want to be sanctified. I do. I do. Father, thank you for your work of sanctification. It's all by grace. Um, there's nothing in us. No good thing dwells in us. Yet we stand before you righteous who are in Christ this morning. I pray for that one or two or 20 this morning that, that are finally convicted by your gospel, that the law has brought them to the end of their sin that you may save them today by your gracious hand, by your spirit powerfully working. And I pray you give strength to each of us to respond rightly, however you desire for us to respond, for the glory of Christ. In his name we pray, amen.